Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second instalment of our DDC 360 Industry Insights Series. Thank you very much for joining today. I appreciate that it is uh, it's very hot and warm outside, so appreciate you taking the time to listen in to us all for uh, for the next 45 minutes or so. And if you cast your mind back to last month, we were joined by John Waterman, the COO of Wilmot Dixon, and Kevin Orme, the head of facilities for Care UK. And the focus was very much on how their industries were adapting to their new norm. And this month, we're going to continue on the same theme. So it's all about how we as an industry are adapting to that new norm and also how we're continuing to scale up. And for obvious reasons, we're, we're going to avoid any commercially sensitive information from being shared today. And the focus is going to be on adapting to that new norm, but from the contractor's perspective. We are completely live, so we're hoping, fingers crossed, that all the technology works today. And apologies in, adva in advance if any of our panellists who are working from home get interrupted by unruly children or pets. Uh, we are purely live. So I'm going to move forward and introduce our guests for today. We are joined by two uh, esteemed guest panellists from the industry who are going to discuss how the world has changed for contractors over the past couple of months and how they are managing their business as we scale back up to some degree of normality. So firstly, I'm joined by Craig Bell, who is the CEO, CEO of Bell Group, one of the UK's largest commercial painting and decorating contractors. So uh, welcome, Craig. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, secondly is uh, Ben Doherty, the Managing Director of Cousins Group, um, who provide painting decorating to a wide range of public, private and main contractor clients. I think it's fair to say predominantly in, in construction within the M25. Yeah. Glad I got that right, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> and alongside our two industry guests, I'm joined by John Henderson, who is the Managing Director of Dulux Decorator Centres and also my boss, so we'll be getting the easiest questions today. Um, yeah, that's before, great. Uh, before we turn to our panel discussion, I'm just going to invite each of our guests just to tell us a little bit more about their businesses and also how they've they've found the past couple of months. So, Craig, if it's all right, I'll um, I'll I'll start with you. So, could you tell us a little bit more about Bell Group and and how you guys have found the past past few months? Um, yeah, certainly. Firstly, I would say it's been uh, interesting. Is is probably <laughs> the sort of nice way of putting it. Um, but the, in all honesty, it's been horrendous. I think it's been horrendous for for all businesses, and we we might want to sort of try and find some positives, and there'll be positives coming out of it. But it's been an incredibly difficult time for any business. We are um, predominantly a, a redecorations business, or our turnover, anticipated turnover for this year is about 114 million and about 60, 65 percent of that will come in, in the form of decorating. The trades that we work, the, the sectors that we work in are social housing, healthcare, ministry of defence, local authority, um, education, all buildings that are um, occupied buildings. There are, there are the all, almost all the projects that we work on, we come into contact with members of the public. And as a result, from, from the very early part of this pandemic, we've had to really um, take care of our own people, but also take care of, um, of the people that we're coming into contact with as well. And it's, it's not been easy. There's not been anything easy about it. Um, it is now fortunately beginning to get going again and we're uh, we're quite excited to see what positives we can take a little bit like you're you're saying Ollie about the the, the things that, that you're looking at as a business uh, before and the, the how some of the bad habits that we've got into over the years actually we can block some of those trends and, and move on to be a better business as a result of it yeah I think it's um it's fair to say a lot's changed over the past couple of months. Uh, we were reflecting uh, a couple of minutes ago on uh, the point at which this started to feel like it was getting uh, to be a lot more serious when uh, myself and Craig had a meeting in, in our head office that had to be uh, evacuated at the, the start of March. Um, so it feels like a lot's, lot's happened in the past couple of months. Um, thanks for that, Craig. Um, ben, do you want to let us know a little bit more about Cousins and, and how you guys have, uh, have found the past few months? Yeah, sure. So um, we're um, uh, a very different 
company to um, to Bells. Um, we were discussing the other day, myself and Craig, the probably only the sim only similarity between the two of us is we buy paint. Um, we work predominantly for um, major contractors. So um, not all new build, but a lot of new build, um, some refurbishment. Um, we're probably 90%, 80 to 90% central London, and then the rest around the southeast of England. Um, we um, operate with a, a different type of workforce to what to what Craig would do. Um, the very nature of central London work is, is guys travelling around on tubes, trains, rather than men in vans, um, which brings which brings different different challenges. Um, yeah, as, as Craig said, it's been it's been um, strange times challenging challenging all the way through and and different challenges almost every week from from the first first week of lockdown where um, my personal opinion is the construction industry um, got caught napping a bit really um, they were slightly shocked by the lockdown and, were, and weren't ready for it weren't anticipating it um, and then what confused matters was a lack of a lack of guidance, I think, from from government of, of what the industry should do, um, and that that came to fruition with some some of our clients immediately closing sites, and then almost two days later saying, "Hang on, not sure why we've done that," and reopening sites. Um, some some contractors not closing sites at all. Um, and and some closing for for a bit longer than a few days um but generally most of our sites stayed open apart from a, a few days here and there maybe some of them for a week or two but none none longer than that um the main challenges became um particularly our people in london getting people around london um public transport obviously a major issue um and um, how to how to keep keep our, our our team safe, but keep providing a service to our clients that that were um, it, it came to a sort of point where people were insistent, clients were insistent. No, we're going to keep trading. We're going to keep going through this, and they looked to us to respond in the same way. Um, so. You've got to, you know, you've got to keep that in mind and try and keep that going. But at no point put your put your team at risk. So that was that was the main challenge over the first week or two, and that was um, that was a lot of time on the phone. I don't think I've ever spent so much time on the phone. Um, constant constant calls from clients of updates of where we were as a business. Are you still operating? Have you still got guys coming to site, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, it was um yeah it was like i say it was it was challenging um and we are we are hopefully coming out the the um the worst of it now um providing we get no more shocks um but yeah so you're you finding now then um most of your most of your guys are back out on site now so most sites are getting closer to some degree of full operation again um every every one of our sites is open um apart from a couple of our cross rail jobs um which i think is more of a um a separate issue um we are not at, at full capacity we're at about 75 percent now um we, ge we, we generally um operate on 45 to 50 sites at any one time that went down to its lowest point 22 is now back up to um over 40. And we generally are around, as an average across the year, about 200 operatives. At its lowest point, that went down to 80, and we're now around about 155. Um, and the main reason we're not at capacity is just work being available for us. Um, I think most people will have heard the, the problems with plasterboard and plaster coming, coming to site, um, which obviously hugely affects decorating because if walls aren't plastered or built you can't paint them um yeah so we, we've seen a, a huge jump and a huge recovery over the last um two to three weeks um probably expecting that to plateau slightly now for for a month or so while while the industry catches up
Yeah. So sorry, I'll just come back to Craig briefly, if that's okay, because I think it highlights just the difference in um, in the two the two businesses. I guess Craig, how um, how have you managed your, your workforce over that that time in terms of the amount of people you've got operational sites open, and, and where are you guys up to now? As, as Ben said, we're, we are very different businesses, and and that has been reflected, I think, in, in the way that we've had to to perform and and the things that we've had to do. Um, if you go back to to the very early part of this um, 23rd of March, I think was the official lockdown date, and that that announcement came on a Monday evening. And we had an emergency board meeting that evening and closed all our sites down on the 24th. We didn't have anyone on site on the 24th, aside from um, some of the healthcare projects we do, the MOD work we do. That that was all classed as kind of key worker status. So we had, in rough terms, about um, just shy of 10% of our workforce were still out on the ground, and about the same in terms of office staff. We kept about 10% of the office staff um, still uh, fully deployed and, and, and fully operational. But um, yeah, com completely different story from Ben's in that, from our point of view, it was it was almost in our interest to try and close things down because we genuinely believed that if we were to put um, our people into the the norm their normal working environments, then quite frankly we were putting them at risk, and we just weren't willing to do that. Um, also, the other issue that we had, um, which I, from speaking to Ben, I think you've a, not a dissimilar problem, is uh, the construction industry generally suffers from having a larger percentage of people that fall into the, the vulnerable or, or shielding type category. So we um, very quickly had to put things in place to take a certain percentage of our, our workforce, considerably more than I expected it to be, and put provisions in place to either protect them or have them working from home or have them just at home doing nothing. Um, and that, that came in even earlier than the lockdown. We were trying to put things in place very quickly for that. And if I'm being honest, that's still my biggest concern now coming out of this process. We now, um, we, we actually started to mobilise on the 11th of May. Um, that was that was kind of our date. And then actually when the announcements came from the, the government, that kind of tied in with that. But um, the problem we had with going live on that day is it was always going to be very much a slow burn. There was a lot of our clients had people furloughed or didn't want us there or just were still very um, reluctant to have people on their on their properties. So that's been very much a slow build and we've, we've managed to get that back up now to um, about 50% of our sites actually are probably back active again. Um, it's more like 60 or 70% of our workforce that are back working. Um, our target by the end of June was to have about 90% back, which we look like we're not going to be too far off of that, um, and then be at 100% by, by the end of July. But it's very much for us been based on um, looking at our, our working practices and actually completely reinventing them. So, you know, looking at the, the new norm is the, the cliche that people keep using. Um, but actually, there really is a new norm, and, and we're having to look at it and say, forget necessarily the government advice, but actually, how can we operate as a business without putting our people at risk. And if you look at things like general health and safety legislation, we are, we are applying that to, to COVID and saying, well, actually, how do we um, create safe safe working environments? And the, um, the people are just going to have to get used to the fact that things need to be done differently. Hold that thought, because that's one of, the, uh, one of the first questions for the panel discussion. So I will come okay. back to you, and Craig. Um, before we skip on to that, uh, last but not least, uh, John, what, yes. uh, what's been the biggest challenge for you and Dulux Decorator Centres? Yeah, I think uh, primary concern, you know, as the guys have already mentioned, was uh, safety. And I think safety's been at the heart of the business for a long time, quite rightly, but uh, it took a, a kind of different twist and turn, if you like. So having to apply uh, different uh, ways of working to the most simple of tasks that we probably just took for granted, like signing for goods, receiving a delivery, writing a specification on site, stuff like that. Uh, all of that had to be adapted so that we could, you know, we could operate safely and still provide the service that our, that our customers need. Uh, and, you know, I remember the day that, that, that Craig was in the office when, uh, when things started to change for us all. Uh, and then we moved through a cycle of that, really. Uh, we, we firstly started uh, stationing people at home who could work at home. Uh, we then went through a, you know, a pretty tumultuous 48, 72-hour period where we closed all our, our stores. And then very quickly, uh, 
because some of our customers were were needing support, we uh, we reopened uh, a number, uh, fifty odd in geographically uh, suitable locations, so that we could, we could serve as clients who were working on uh, on essential construction and the like. Uh, and then it's just, as you know, Ollie, it's just it's just grown from there. But uh, yeah, it's not something that I'd uh, I'd like to repeat in my career. Um, but I do think a lot of goods come out of it where. I think a lot of the, you know, the bad habits or the the ways of working that we that we previously thought were normal, uh, we've cut through quite a lot of that. We've had to change quite a lot. So whilst it's been difficult, I think there have been some uh, some benefits. And what I wouldn't like to see is that we just drift back uh, to what we, to, you know, to the way that we were before. Because I think we've learned, you know, we've learned so much and 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 done a lot of good things in in the last three months. But yeah, it's. Uh, Long hours, lots of Skype calls, lots of telephone calls, lots of Zoom meetings. Uh, it's been it's been pretty full on for the last uh, the last few months. Yeah. And um, how open for business are Julep Decorator Centres now? Yeah. So as I said, we we back at sort of the end of March, we we closed. We quickly uh, became operational again. Throughout uh, the the month of May, we started to ramp up the uh, ramp up the business. Uh, so we added a click, a call and collect model to our delivery model. Uh, we then started to uh, to open more of the store estate up, and you know, as I sit here today, I'm delighted to say that all of our stores are open, and the doors of those stores are open, so that our customers are able to uh, to shop with us uh, either online uh, through the capability we've improved on our website, but also face to face as well, uh, or, or delivery, whatever whatever's suitable for for. Uh, for our customers, but uh, yeah, it, it is a different environment from what it was before because social distancing is uh, is still the norm. But you know, I think if I had my time over again, uh, we'd probably have done a few things differently. And uh, I think we've learned as at, at times as we've gone along. But you know, let's be honest, there was no playbook for this. Um, but what I'm pleased uh, I'm pleased with, and it sounds like Ben and Craig have done exactly the same as. We've made the right decisions with the, with the information that we had at the time, or what we thought were the right decisions, uh, but always, always with the uh, with the safety of our, our colleagues and our customers uh, at the heart of those decisions. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been a journey, but we and we've still we're, and we're still on it. So things will still continue to evolve over the uh, the coming days, weeks, months, uh, and we'll just see where it takes us. I suppose just the the last question I've got for for you, John, is is around supply. Um, is supply as good as it as it has been previously? Well, I think supply is obviously a, a balance between uh, the demand that's out there and what the uh, what the, the factories can produce. And uh, I think it's fair to say that whilst we've gone through the last few months where supply has probably been more depressed in the professional uh, side of the business because of the reasons the guys have highlighted. Um, Equally, the consumer demand has been unbelievable, uh, and obviously that puts a strain on our manufacturing plants, where um, they are having to adapt their operation to fit the, if you like, the, the new normal. But you know, it's great, great to see that the plants are, that the manufacturing plants are working 24/7. They're working flat out to produce product to meet that demand. It's always going to be a, a tricky balance, and I think it'll, it'll continue to be so while we see. Uh, this un these unprecedented uh, levels of demand uh, from uh, people who seem to have found a love for decorating again or just want to fill in the time uh, that they've got on their hands. But uh, yeah, the thing that would be great for us, and I think these are this is one of the benefits that I'm looking for out of, uh, uh, out of the crisis, if you like, is that we, we work better together with our customers. We become more planned. We're more advanced in our knowledge about what is required, when it's required, where it's required, and that way we can schedule it in the production and make sure that you know we we, we can uh, look to satisfy that demand where it's needed. So yeah, that's that's where we are for now. Right. Thanks, John. Um, what I'm going to jump onto now is our panel discussion. So we've got a couple of questions that we've either pre-prepared or a couple of questions that came through from other contractors in advance that I thought were pertinent for us to discuss as a, as a panel. Just want to remind uh, the audience as, as well, um, on the control panel on the right-hand side, you'll see the ability to, to ask questions. 
we'll just encourage you once we've finished this panel discussion, we'll come back to any any live questions that, uh, that our audience today have submitted in. So if you've got any questions for any of us, make sure you uh, you drop them in and, uh, and keep it clean. Um, Craig, I probably want to build on a point that you were you were starting to make uh, before uh, up front, and um, the question we got is is how have you had to adapt your operations, and what do you think are the key factors to consider when businesses start to scale their workforce back up again? Yeah, well, as I said, only I mean the government advice is one thing, and actually, um, what I start off by saying is one one of my biggest frustrations through this whole thing um, has been. And every morning I put on BBC Breakfast and I hear business owners from fisheries, farmers, decorating contractors, whatever, standing up and making these sweeping statements that the government haven't told them what to do. The government haven't told us how we can go back to work. They've not told us this. They've not. And I keep saying, these people are the only people that know their own business. The government can't stand there and tell, I don't know how many registered businesses there are in the UK, but it's got to be millions. So the government can't go and tell every single business how they should reopen their business and what they should do to get their business working again. I think that the only people that can do that are us, the, the, the people that run and manage businesses. So the, the big thing from my point of view, and actually the thing I'm probably most proud of through this whole thing is, firstly, we have we've kept our focus on the people rather than on on the pound if you like so you know the, the pound will take care of itself through time and obviously we'd be being very irresponsible business owners if, if we were to just completely ignore that but we have focused very much on looking after our people making sure that they come first firstly their, their health and well-being and and secondly making sure that we try and keep them employed on which i guess the two things are are, are linked so from our point of view as and when government basic government information has come out we've tried to apply that to our business so we've sat down as a group and we've said okay well here's what's been said how can we make that work for us and if you take the basics of the kind of two meter social distancing um, scenario that we looked at and said okay how, how can we make that work and the, the very first thing I said is, in our offices, it doesn't work. The, our, our current office setups, it doesn't work. So as a result, we've said people, people who can work from home will continue to work from home. And we will do that for as long as we possibly can. Um, we're not working to try and reopen our offices because we just don't think it's necessarily safe. Even if the government wants to open pubs or whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. I think if people can work at home, let's keep them working from home. So that was the first thing. Then we looked at our sites and we said, okay, how, how do we normally operate? And again, this will be different from Ben, but most of our, I think most of Ben's guys work on their own, where our guys tend to work in teams. So our guys will work in teams of two or three. So you have these teams of two or three roughly, but we might have a site that's got 20 people working on it. But those 20 people won't all work siloed. They'll tend to work in those kind of teams of two or three, very roughly. Um, so what we decided to do was look at where the biggest risk was to the individuals and also to the business. And firstly, we felt that there was a big risk in if we had a site, say, with 20, 20 people working on it, if one person got the virus, the chances were very quickly, because obviously it takes so long for um, the sort of incubation period of the, of the virus, we felt that the chances were the majority of that, that group would end up getting it. We then looked at the risk of, we do tend to have people moving about from jobs, so you'll have maybe a core of if there are 20 people in a job, there's maybe a core of 15 or 16 that have stayed on that. But then occasionally you'll have a team drop in that maybe experts at using a hydraulic platform or, you know, some sort of specialism. So very quickly, those people, if they caught the virus, would become, you know, super spreaders of it and, and kind of go through the workforce creating a problem. And again, there's two aspects there. One, there's the, the well-being of our people. And then two, there's actually the, the well-being of the business. And we can't recover as a business if we if, if we don't have the resource to do it. So if, we, if we're sitting saying, oh, we've got a third or a quarter or half of our um, workforce that have all, all caught this virus, then we've got no chance. There's, there's no way we'll be able to get back to where we are. So there's definitely the two aspects. So the way we've got around that with um, with our site working is we've decided to create what we're calling work bubbles. But the work bubbles are, in effect, these teams of two, three, or four that we would normally have had anyway, but we're actually formalizing those. So what we're now saying is, if you work with this individual and this individual, you now always work with them and you don't actually cross over with any of the other individuals. So if we've got 20 people working on a project, what we've done is broken that down into maybe five or six mini projects. And each of those teams of, let's say, three, the ideal would be three, um, three people, 
those three people might have a section of a building or a certain number of properties that they are going to complete. And they will do the, the full process so that there doesn't have to be anybody coming from, from the outside. That, that has so far seems to have worked really well. And we've, we've actually had to completely restructure the way we, we work our, our vehicles. So each of these pods has a, a form of transport and can get there. We then have to look at things like, um, do they have the, the, the training needs? So do they have the skill base to do everything that needs done on those properties or in that section of the building? So, so with that, we've had to completely develop our workforce while kind of almost restructuring the workforce at the same time. Um, I think it's worked really well and I've been getting really good feedback and I've had a number of clients actually send us really nice emails saying, you know, we seem really, really to have got it and that the, the guys on the ground seem very, very up to speed with what they should and shouldn't be doing. And that's great news for me, not necessarily that the clients are happy, but it means that the guys on the ground are actually doing what we're asking them to do. And that's that's really important. And that's that's really a culture thing, you know. If we've got a culture where people feel that we are looking after them, then actually they take that instruction and they say, "Yeah, okay, fine, we'll we'll do this. We'll 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 go we'll we'll go and do what you're asking us because they believe you're doing it for the right reasons." I think if they just think that you're, you're giving them lip service, then I guess they'll give the, they'll give you lip service as well and not necessarily go through with it. But um, as I say, it, it really it very much is a new norm. It's very much starting from scratch and saying where are the dangers in our business and looking at how we can mitigate those from start to finish. And I think that anybody um, who runs a business needs to needs to do that. They can't just wait on government advice and, and try and follow it to the letter of the law. It very much has to be um, it's, well, one size fits all is the, the kind of opposite, if you like. It's, it's, uh, it has to be a bespoke solution. Completely agree. Um, and it's probably useful to get your take on that from a, from a different sort of industry working in a really pressurised central London construction environment. Um, so same question, I guess, what, what are the key factors um, you think you need to consider when businesses start scaling back up again? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Craig said um, with regards to people looking, looking elsewhere for people to tell them what to do, how to, how to protect their staff and how to, um, how to operate. We, we know our industry, we know how it works, we know um, how, how, what things we can go forward with, what things we can't. We know what the risks are. The government have clearly laid out what the risks are, what the risks are of spreading, catching the virus. Um, so we're all um, experienced enough in, in business and operating our businesses to know how to do what we do. So we should be experienced enough to know how to adapt. Um, our, our sites are slightly different to, to Craig's in that, um, I say our sites, that's, that's the problem. They are not our sites. They are sites of the main contractor. So um, it, it, it very much falls into the, the health and safety management. Um, we've become an industry that I believe is now very good with its health and safety management. Um, um, the risk assessment process of everything that we do. And I think this, this falls into that. Um, we, we know the restrictions, we know what we shouldn't do. So you risk assess every single task of, of can you carry out that task and maintain the social distance and, and control the um, transfer of, of lots of individuals touching certain surfaces, etc. So I, I think that that's where we are. That's where we have been, and that's where this will continue to go. It will just become another tier of our health and safety practices that must be adhered to. Um, and that's that is generally what is happening across the sites that we've got. Um, as a trade, um, Craig touched on it. We're, we're slightly different to them in that if, if we've got two painters that are working within two meters of each other, something's gone wrong anyway. Um, unless they're using a specialist material that needs the two, needs two, two people on it, generally they shouldn't be working near each other um, and also shouldn't be working near other trades because if you're working next to another trade, something's gone wrong. Um, so that, that helps us as a trade to maintain social distancing while, whilst we're working. The challenges then became on the, on the large sites and all of our sites are generally large sites with anywhere between 200 and 500, probably more than 500 in some instances, um, various trades people across the job. Um, 
and how do you uh, maintain safe movement around the site, um, site welfare, canteens, uh, bathrooms, toilets, showers, um, um, access and egress from the site. Um, so many of our sites for the last two years have been operating on, on fingerprint touching, which couldn't be any worse in this environment. Um, even to the point of um, this was just, just as, as um, COVID started becoming apparent, um, late, late January, February, early February, and people were being told, when your fingerprint doesn't work, don't lick your finger to, to make it work. I mean, things like that have had to change, the way people access sites. And like I say, they're not our sites, so we're a bit out of control on that. But what we are in control of, of what we can expect um, our staff to get when they get to site. So um, the directive is simple. If it's not right, don't do it. And that's the same as it was concrete. Sorry. Can I ask a quick question? Um, have you found quite a variance in your site so in, in terms of the main contractors, the, the, the different attitudes towards it? Mm. To be honest, no. They've all, they've all stepped up. I was slightly concerned that um, there might be an element of um, putting the right noise out there, but, but when you actually went past the site turnstile, it was a different different scenario. But no, all all the sites that I've been to and the feedback that we've I've had from all across the across the teams is it's good. All all site canteens are separated. All welfare facilities are completely set up to um, restrict. Um, people coming in within two metres of each other. Um, um, a fair amount of our work is in high-rise buildings, new, new residential towers being built in London, left, right and centre, um, which requires lift access up to floors 20 and above. Um, and if you'd gone to the site in January, you'd have 8, 10, 15 people squeezing into a lift, depending on how big the lift was. That can't happen anymore. So there are timetables for accessing the lift. It's generally one person at a time. Um, and again, depending on the size of the lift and people are adapting to that. And as, as I was saying, it's, it, the clear directive to our guys or within our team is, let's not expect anyone to do something we wouldn't be comfortable with doing. Um, and, and if they're not comfortable, don't do it. The same as, like I say, six months ago, don't walk on by if you see someone doing something um, unsafe, working unsafely, working without goggles or a mask. It's exactly the same. Um, if you see someone not adhering to the COVID, um, whether it be distancing restrictions or masks or, or um, just hygiene, um, don't walk past. Don't walk past. Don't accept it. Don't, don't pretend you didn't see it. Um, and it's it's that's gone on a bit further with um, how our teams get to site. As I, as I touched on earlier, Central London is is a bit different. We have had for the last two months, um, most people have taken different routes, um, cycles, driving into London because they've been able to park in Central London for the last two months. Um, guys driving in and parking in Covent Garden. I'm not sure if that's happened in the last 20 years, is it? Um, and congestion charge cancelled, all that kind of thing. Um, that's that's gone now. Um, traffic wardens are back out. Um, congestion charge is back and and increased in in price as well. So people are back on transport, public transport, where they have to. So we're tracking how every one of our operative gets to work. Um, is there a different route? What time are they travelling? Um, we're trying to stagger it wherever we can, so they're not all travelling at that that hour of um, generally six to seven o'clock. Six to half past seven is the uh, is the um, is the rush hour. Um, so letting letting people get to work later or earlier, finish earlier, finish later, however it may be. And and this, and again, going back to this, the simple guideline. If you're at a station and a tube pulls in and it's back to the old ways of, um, you know, like a cattle truck, um, which I haven't seen it, but uh, social media will tell you it's happening in, in certain pinch points around London. 
don't just don't get on the tube. Wait, just wait until until it clears. If that's the next two trains time, so be it. If it's an hour, so be it. Just don't just don't put yourself at risk um, and 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 do what's sensible. So it's 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 supporting the people through that, giving them everything they need. Give masks for for travelling, masks for being on site, um, temperature checking um, regularly. Um, obviously, um, hand sanitization um, at every point that they can, um, and um, yes, yeah, so supporting them to to you know make the right decision. And when they do make the right decision, um, they they've got us, um, like I say, supporting them in in everything that they do. I think there's um, there's really positive message there in some of the stuff you were saying as well, Ben. That. Uh, while practices are are needing to change, actually the work that's been put in over the past decade or so around health and safety means you've, yeah. you've got the structure to see things through and the commitment from site practices to make it work. Um, it probably some of the bit, bits you're saying towards the end about um, giving you guys the confidence to not get on a tube if they need to probably mm. comes on quite nicely to the next question that I'm gonna I'm gonna send your way, John. Because um, we, we talk about people and safety being at, at the core of, of what all of us have done in the industry. Um, but with a lot of the changes over the past couple of months, how, how have you supported um, mental well-being of, of your team through this period, myself included? Good question. Maybe I can turn it back on you and ask you the answer to that in a second, in all Uh I, well, look, I think mental well-being in the workplace or even mental well-being in general is incredibly important anyway. We know it is, uh, and not just as a result of COVID-19, uh, but notwithstanding, COVID-19 has brought it a lot to the fore because people have had to change the way that they're, uh, that, that they're working, the way that they're living uh, quite dramatically, and, and it, does have, uh, it does have an impact. You know, as a business, we've made a long-term commitment to uh, mental well-being through our association with the Mind uh, Wellbeing uh, Workplace, uh, it's where we, we can learn and contribute to, to research to, uh, to, improve, uh, to improve the situation. I think in general, what we've done in the last three months, um, I think the colleagues have really, uh, you know, colleagues and teams have really stepped in to look after each other. You know, we, we've kept the business informed at every, uh, every stage of the way, but it's been great to see some of the stuff that the, that the teams have done to keep in touch, if you like. So Skype meetings, Zoom face-to-face -face quizzes, even a simple phone call. Really noticing if somebody's, you know, not attended a few meetings and just putting in a call to check everything's okay. Uh, and I actually think it'll help us come back stronger uh, to, you know, whatever, whatever we come back to. Uh, but I, I think I think that's been really, really important. And you know, we've not. We've encouraged it and we facilitated some of it, but what's been great for me to see is that people have done that themselves as well because you know they care about themselves, they care about each other, they care about the business, they're trying to keep in touch with their customers as well. So I think it's been a collective effort, but you now let's face it, we're, we're on a journey um, and uh, it really needs to become mental health and mental health awareness really needs to become a much stronger part of everyday business, if you like. We've talked a lot about health and safety, and uh, it, you know, for me, it's part of that. So uh, I, I think it's it's a great time for for all companies to really put some more energy or where it's required behind behind this topic, and and just make it you know just make it part and parcel of uh, business. Uh, and I think we can work together. I think we can learn from each other, uh, so that uh, so that it becomes better for, for for everybody that's involved in the business because. It is really important to people, and uh, I think it, I think it's a great platform for us now to take to, to take the journey on the next uh, to the next level, if you like. Mm. I agree. I think there's a there's a consistent theme that I think Ben and Craig have both touched on as well, around giving people confidence. Uh, you know, I think Craig, you you were talking at the start just about one of the focuses being keeping people in work, and actually giving people that that confidence in the in the business that they're that they're working for. Um, I'll move on to, to my next question now, and um, this actually supports something that I, I was reading the other day around uh, consumer insights for Juliet's Decorator Centre. Obviously, we, we act as a retailer. We support a vast uh, array of, of different types of customer. 
and um, I was looking at consumer surveys that were showing that previously where people would choose where they go to shop, be it a Tesco's, an Asda or a home base or a Dulux decorator centre, previously it would have been around price, range, um, the typical things you would expect are at the top of how people choose where they where they shop. Um, whereas now, uh, how um, consumers and how clients uh, are picking and choosing who they interact with, be it a painting contractor or, or be it a Asda or Tesco's where they go to shop, um, two top things on that list now are um, are they are they acting safely you know do they protect my safety as a consumer and the safety of their um, their employees and secondly is about social impact so I had a question which I'll, I'll send your way to start with Craig since we've had we've had a couple of conversations about um, social impact and social value is how important do you think social impact is going to be to your clients moving forwards well, it's a really interesting one, Ollie, because I, I think at the moment I've got such a conflicting view on this. So, yeah, as you know, uh, social values since day one of our business 30 years ago, it's always been right at the heart of what we do, just because we believe in doing the right thing. And we also work in quite a lot of deprived communities. So often with where we're working, the nature of work that we're doing, we feel it is the right thing to do to, to give something back at the same time as, as taking something from, um, from these projects. Um, there's, we, we have a, a team of, of 10 people that their job is to engage with communities, engage with our clients to try and um, develop a, a sort of bond between us when we're carrying out work in these areas and, and the end, end users and the building users. And it generally works very well and it's something we are recognised for as a business. But going forward, I think that there is a, 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 the nature of what we do currently isn't going to work. No, for the, and certainly not in the short term. The type of projects that we do, the type of events that we organise, getting people together, um, gathering people to try and bring them together and, and create communities and, and create bonds between people, is exactly juxtaposition with, with what we're trying to what we're trying to do at the moment to keep keep people apart and, and stop spreading the virus. So there's there's that side, um, which is obviously something that we are spending a lot of time thinking about how we can how we can look at things differently and how we can do things differently because going forward I think there's going to be a need for community and a need for people to try and come together after all of this and, and get through all of this. Um, it's fairly inevitable, none of us really touched on you know, any of the government schemes that have been put in place etc and as I said to you before Ollie, the, um, the, the furlough scheme has been, been a godsend for us as a business. Um, as it has for, for uh, certainly I would say most businesses in our industry, um, but inevitably we're all going to have to pay for that. There's going to come a time where we all have to pay for that, and that's going to have a knock-on effect on the economy. And uh, it sadly is is an absolute fact that the people that get hit most when the economy goes tend to be the people that need it the most, that need, need the most amount of help and need the most amount of assistance. So I do think that we're going to be entering into a prolonged period in our country of needing to look at the, the kids that are just coming out of school, for example, that won't have employment opportunities and won't have anywhere to go. And there is a lot of evidence to show that the kids that do that and the generations that do that because of um, economic downturns, etc., that, that, that stays with them for life. It's, the, the, it's that, that's, that's just a fact. The people that come out of school and because of the, the economic conditions can't get into work, they, they never recover from it. They might end up in, in work or they might end up with a job, but they never fulfil really their, their, their true potential. Um, we, we would like to try and help with that as a business, but it needs to be a, a more global, it needs to be a more global uh, take on it and a more, a more sort of a, a wider stance that the, that the whole country takes towards it. We need to look at the people that have struggled most, the, the, the charities that, that don't have the, the same level of funding that they normally do. We need to look at the, the deprived areas where people are losing their jobs. As I said, the, the kids that are coming out of school and can't get jobs. Um, and we need to, as responsible contractors, we need to look and say, what can we do to assist with that? What can we do to help? Is that creating job opportunities, is it training opportunities, is it just being a little bit more aware and, and talking to people and um, I think that 
that can be a big part of it. And people do, at the moment, I do think are a little bit more pliable. So I think that by talking to people and even by talking to some of our own people and having conversations about maybe being a bit more flexible with working hours, which might allow uh, less redundancies, for example, not necessarily talking about our business, just, just generally companies that are looking at redundancies. Can a, a bigger picture be looked at where people say, well, if everybody works five less hours every week, then actually we don't need to make anybody redundant and, and looking at looking at situations like that. But I do think that going forward, there is going to be a massive need for community involvement and, bring, and trying to develop and create communities. And I think sadly, the, the current circumstance, just, it, the two things just don't work well together. So there, there, there is a big, there, there's a, a big piece needs, needs done on this. People really need to get their heads together and think about it. I think there's, um, there's a slightly adjusted question that I was going to send to, to John and, and Ben on this as well, um, briefly before we, we bring in some live questions. Um, and I guess it's, uh, I'll, I'll start with, I'll start with you, John, if that's okay. Um, what do you believe businesses like like ours um, can do to support the wider industry? Because I think I completely agree with what Craig's saying. I think there is a collective responsibility, but I guess what are the, the sort of things that you think we could we could be looking to do? Yeah, well, I think I think firstly, Ollie, given our position in the industry, it's only right and proper that we should do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think there are a number of things that we can do, but m maybe one I could I could focus in on just now is that. Uh, we're, uh, we're launching a, a hub location on our website that will connect decorators with larger decorating firms. So, and I think we've spoken at length that one of the, the, the issues that faces our larger customers is a lack of available labour. Uh, and if you look at the, 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 the sort of output of the crisis, uh, potentially uh, we've got a lot of, if you like, sole traders uh, who are professionals um, who have been impacted by the COVID crisis, so inaccessibility to somebody's home, uh, that kind of thing, who are actively looking for work, or even worse, may, may end up uh, dropping out of the profession altogether as a result. So I think if we can if we can find a way of linking those two, and pulling those two together, then that benefits both our larger customers and, 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 and the individual uh, smaller businesses. So, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what that what that brings because I think it could be hugely positive. Yeah, I agree. And Ben, uh, apologies yeah. being the third one to answer the question uh, means you've got the the short stick. Is there anything you'd you'd add to you'd add to that? Um, we, yeah, I mean, I think I think um, we have to see the opportunities that come out of this to 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 make change the construction industry particularly in the, the field we work in, in large sites can sometimes be a bit like that that old oil tanker that is going in one direction and everyone want, wants to turn it in another direction but it takes a long time um, and one of the big things i think around that is um, efficiency on site um, the site environment um, is it a good place to work um, and I think that has a massive effect on how many people come into the industry. Um, far too often, sites are dirty places. Um, now, that obviously, it's a building site. There's going to be an element of dirt. I'm not saying they, they can be spick and span, but um, when you're talking about welfare facilities and, and toilets, et cetera, et cetera, they're not as clean as they should be. And, and how are you going to attract people into an industry, new people into an industry, that um, provides that environment. And that environment, I believe, generally comes from the approach that we've had for the last, well, for the whole time I've been in the industry, a job gets done by putting more people on site. That's it. Mm -hmm. in, 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 our, in, our, in our industry, in our office, the old term of, we've got to throw labor at that. Um, no, we don't. We need to look at the efficient way to do it reduce the, the, the number of people on site. And that isn't, that isn't therefore reducing the number of employees we have. Our only restriction to growth really is people. Um, so if we have less people on sites, we can have more sites. Um, and we can therefore, um, I, I believe sites will get more efficient, they'll get cleaner, they'll get nicer places to work. Um, and then, we will, will be able to attract more people in, into the industry. 
I mean, we, we, we start um, a huge number of apprentices. We have hubs in colleges that bring people into the industry. Um, unfortunately, I think there's too much to, to, to turn them off. And like I say, the oil tanker has been trying to change for the last 10, five to 10 years. But now look at what's happened here. All of a sudden we have to have less people on site. Not, oh, let's work towards less people on site. We have to have less people on site. So let's not do things twice. Um, let's not throw throw labour at something to get it finished. Uh, John John from Wilmot Dixon touched on it last week. Um, that Wilmot Dixon are looking at it, which is is good to hear. Let's let's do things with the least amount of people on site. Um, and as for a business like ours, that just means we'd be able to work on more sites um, and bring more people into the industry. It wouldn't, it wouldn't actually mean we'd have less less employees would be able to work on more sites and bring more people into the industry and 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 put youngsters coming in in a nice place to work because um, that's the only way you're going to uh, attract them in and 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 bring in like Craig said people who people who need work who want work and bring them into an industry that wants them as well and and looks after them um, so like I say I, I think it's an opportunity it is it's not very often you get a change happen overnight that has to happen um and we can we can get some benefit from it that's a really good point thank you ben i suggest in the interest of time i uh, i just revert to the control panel where we've, we do have a couple of uh, questions from from our audience um so first one i'm going to start with uh, is from robert wilson from wilson decorators so thank you robert for uh, for firstly um putting your name down on it as well um the question is, uh, I guess I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase some of this. Have, have you guys had um, much contact from the government directly, whether it's the business ministers or, or anybody else that's giving you guidance on what's, what's going to happen next? I um, when, when we spoke previously, um, and I mentioned it earlier, um, I think the, the government didn't clarify early on not not how we should operate but whether whether we should operate as a as a as a um, industry they didn't say construction will carry on and they didn't say construction will stop they just left it hanging um we got a letter from um secretary of state 31st of march um directed to all of the industry um encouraging us to continue trading obviously to work safely um, but highlighting what an important part construction played in the overall um, um, economy and to keep to keep trading. What I then found talking to clients of ours, um, talking to other decorators, other contractors, that not everyone receives that. Um, I, I had an instance where I forwarded that on to a, a director of a major construction company. Um, so um i suppose in short my answer is no we haven't really had any communication apart from one letter um which was just to the industry and from my understanding didn't get out to as much of the industry as it should have done um i've got a i've got a good one here for you i think craig um we're all in a recovery scale up phase of operations at the moment are you concerned that as the end of the year starts approaching and less external works are available that we might find ourselves in a difficult situation come q4 where people are still nervous about potential in internals being carried out um, the, the simple answer is yes um yeah absolutely um we are we're quite hopeful that as the year goes on um that the the, the will become uh, better controls over the virus rather than just everybody staying apart um, but yes absolutely is, is the simple answer what we're trying to do is deal with the problems as they come up and the problem at the moment is quite simply we need to get people back on sites again so what we are trying to do is ramp up the external sites really get the externals moving and we are in fact at the board meeting yesterday and, and one of the conversations we were having was about the uh, the different clients that we have that do generally have a lot of internal works and the, the type of discussions that we could have to 
to delay those works and, and how we can manage it. The um, the one positive I would say in the nature of work that we carry out is that we are finding a lot of the, the government funded organisations we work for are actually trying to re uh, position some of their budgets towards external works. So certain clients that maybe spend half a million, a million pounds a year on external programmes are actually turning around to us and saying that they're considering adding 50% or 100% to those budgets and that they do want us to keep going. And I think a lot of that is because they want to stimulate the economy, they want to get people moving again, and they know that they can't spend them on kitchen and bathroom replacements, for example. So if they can't spend them on kitchen and bathroom replacements, what can they do externally? The problem that might come with that is we might get a tough winter. I've always said that I believe that the weather over the course of the year usually balances itself out. We've had a phenomenal year so far, so it's inevitable that we're going to get a, a whole load of rain and a whole load of cold, windy weather coming up at one point. So, yes, I, I, I think it is a concern, but as it stands at the moment, we just need to um, take one problem at a time. Um, I'll probably throw one last uh, live question out. What I would say, there's there's been quite a few come through, is... Um, any questions that anybody asks today that we, we don't get the chance to answer live, we will answer and it will appear on uh, the Hub site that we've set up. So watch out for emails with the links afterwards. But um, the last question uh, actually comes from uh, our very own Nick Holton, which I think is probably quite a nice nice one to end on to, to send Craig's way and Ben's way. Um, what more can we as a supplier do to support your business? I don't think we've got one. Um, <laughs> Craig, you can start since it's your account okay. manager who's asked the question. Yeah, well, firstly, hi, Nick. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Um, the, the, the really easy one would be if you halved all of your prices, that would be a big help to us, uh, John. <laughs> so no, I, I, but, uh, on, on a serious note, it's um, it, it's a case of everybody's in it together at the moment. So I think what we all need to do is we all need to be as pliable as possible. We all need to react to things as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but I think you know what, one of the things that, that Nick and I have been working on is we've been looking at uh, Bell Group going completely um, solvent free by the end of 2021. Um, and actually, I think things like the you know the opportunity we have now to to create a new norm and, and to do things differently. I think there are certain things like that that I know Nick and I started looking at about six months ago, and we haven't really um, taken it uh, to where I would like to so far. But now is the time I think where we need to actually start really actioning things like this and saying, like, rather than us waiting until I think Ben sort of touched on this before, but rather than getting to a stage where. Um, we, we, we're all just doing things the way we were doing them uh, six months ago or a year ago. Let's actually try and implement new things. Let's think differently today so that as we start re-implementing things, we do gradually just create, um, I hate the term, new normal, but that's what it is. It's a, it, it, it's a new way of doing things. Ben? I, I think, to be honest, um, it is probably just around communication. Um, we are still in very strange times and I think we will be for a while um, um, and there will there already have been and there will inevitably be more surprises for everyone um, so the the amount that we can restrict that between ourselves and the teams and communicate if we see a problem coming if we see a supply issue coming um, of a product um, Let's communicate early, um, and the, the same goes for us communicating with you guys. Is what what we're going to need over the next three to six months, which I know there's a, a, a bit of work going on on that at the moment. But yeah, I think I think communication is is, is the key, um, both ways really. No, I completely agree. Right, I think we've um, we've just about run out of time, but um, I just wanted to extend a, a massive thank you, uh, Ben, Craig, and and John as well for for joining today. Um, it's been really interesting to get your um, take on, on, I guess, firstly, how, how you guys have found the past couple of months, how you've dealt with and adapted to a couple of the changes, but also to get some of that insight on how um, our, our broader audience can continue to support and manage the scale up. And I think if we, if we look forward, I think it's clear to say that there's, there's challenge, but there's also opportunity. I think some of those points we ended on then around communicating and, and uh, approaching the challenges that we've got as a broader industry, I think is, is certainly something that we 
we will take on board and we will take away. But I think there's something there for, for everybody, be you a main contractor, painting contractor, client, supplier. Um, there's there's a lot there in, in clear message for everybody. So um, again, massive thank you to our panellists um, and thank you as well to all of our audience that have joined us today and, uh, and stayed out of uh, the paddling pools. Um, really valuable session. Um, we will be uploading all of this to our hub, so watch out for the email along with answers to any questions we've not had chance to answer. And uh, we will continue to run this. Uh, we might play around with the format a little bit, but we'll be doing something similar again uh, next month. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.